to my session, start new era PS1 uh, repo PowerShell. Anybody knows this picture? So yeah, this picture was used in a ceremony, right, where PowerShell was open sourced. Uh, it was actually not a picture, it was a, a broadcast of uh, the ceremony itself. So I took this out of the YouTube video. Um, I, I'd like to point out that first of all, there's a lot of uh, PowerShell 6 love going on in this conference. Uh, this is uh, maybe a little outdated uh, picture, but uh, uh, well, when investigating the, the agenda, straight away you would see that, hey, there's a lot of PowerShell 6 going on. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about the announcement and keep the amount of slides really short. Uh, I like to address some important GitHub repositories. And uh, from that moment on, it's just straight demos. I'm just gonna show uh, the, the hell out of PowerShell 6, okay? So August 18, 2016 at 11.14 EST, PowerShell uh, was made available on Unix, uh, on OS X and on Windows. Why this uh, strange time? Anybody knows why they use this time? No? Okay, so at the 14th of November, 2006, they introduced PowerShell v1, right? It went GA, so this is kind of a uh, nice to know thing. Um, the current version is uh, Alpha 18, and luckily Joey didn't push the beta out yet because I would be screwed and had to do uh, redo all my demos. Um, PowerShell uh, is open source using the MIT license, basically meaning uh, you can do whatever you like with the source code, and you're, f you're free to redistribute or build your own or whatever. Uh, and one of the uh, bigger announcements, in my opinion as well, is because this, this will break down all firewall debates you guys might have. Uh, PowerShell remoting protocol leveraging SSH. So uh, port 22, of course, is open in every enterprise, but 5985 is, is some kind of issue. So we're going to overstep that issue and just leverage port 22 everywhere. Just an overview slide of uh, all the important GitHub repositories. Uh, of course, we have the github.com uh, slash, slash PowerShell. This is where PowerShell lives, uh, where issues are filed, uh, where pull requests come in, uh, where all the action is happening. Uh, we got uh, Microsoft slash OMI uh, GitHub uh, page. This is where the, the OMI Simom is being uh, developed. Anybody uh, knows WMI? Well, OMI is, of course, what's being used on the other platforms. Uh, this also brings WS Man to Linux right now. We have the PSL OMI provider, which is the PowerShell remoting, pro PowerShell remoting protocol provider for OMI on Linux uh, and OS X. I don't know if it's built for that. Um, and as Joey already told you, uh, we got the PowerShell RFC, which is where all great minds come together and think about new stuff or maybe re-implement old stuff in a better way. And with that, I would like to start my demos. Uh, it's alpha code, so uh, I did not even pray to the demo gods. I just hope everything works. And if it doesn't, I just go on. Um, let's get started. <laughs> Good. Is that viewable a bit in the back? It's not? Better. Okay, what you see here is a CentOS 7.3 uh, installation using the Mate desktop. And I have uh, Visual Studio Code already installed because I wouldn't want to bore you with installing Visual Studio Code. Um, and uh, the PowerShell extension by David Wilson is also uh, already installed, but there's no PowerShell yet on this machine. So what I'm going to show you first is how you're gonna get PowerShell uh, and actually, uh, we used to go, we used to have to go to the PowerShell uh, repository on GitHub and go to the uh, releases page. And in the releases, we were able to find uh, the, the correct downloadable for us, right? So we, we would fetch it, download it, install it, uh, do it like that. Fortunately, Microsoft made available uh, packages.microsoft.com uh, and they made it really easy for you to just uh, install PowerShell through uh, the Linux package management systems. And this is what we're going to uh, do here. So uh, first off, what you see here is a couple of lines, and those are a bit big now, uh, that, that deal with fetching the latest build from GitHub and installing it manually, which we are not going to do. But uh, this is uh, 
a couple of lines that bring in the PowerShell or the, the uh, packages of Microsoft.com repository into this local YUM repository list. It's basically downloading a configuration file that's already configured for you. Uh, instructions, of course, are everywhere on the internet uh, how to do this. So let's run this. I have the, hopefully, internet works, of course. Yeah, internet works. So I downloaded just a configuration file that uh, introduces the packages of Microsoft.com as a valid repository. And if I look now at the repository list, uh, you would see that I, I got a couple of them. And uh, as you can see, maybe packages Microsoft.com, Microsoft minus com minus prod is now in there as well. And this always takes a little bit of time in the enumeration part. And there we go. All right. So if we look at that, uh, uh, what, what that packages of Microsoft.com actually offers us, there's a lot of packages, uh, mainly PowerShell, uh, uh, the PowerShell package, but also the OMI package. So with the part that brings you WS Man is in there. Uh, the PSRP provider, you can just do a YUM uh, install and point it to the uh, the correct name and it just downloads, checks for the dependencies and does in all the installation for you real easily. So what I'm going to do now is I'm calling yum, which is the package manager for, uh, for Red Hat based systems. Uh, and I'm going to say install minus Y, so su suppress the confirmation and install PowerShell, please. So it's, it's downloading that package now from that, that repository. It's checking the dependencies. The dependencies are being resolved within the CentOS uh, repository list automatically. Uh, so it does get installed. So just like uh, lip, lip Unwind is, for example, is a dependent package which is not installed commonly in, in my experience on every Linux box, but it just, it's just automatically resolved for you. And if everything went correctly, we now have PowerShell on Linux, so it's that easy. Okay, just read a little lines of instructions, and you're all set to go. And in case of bad internet, I had all that stuff uh, locally as well. So, luckily, I didn't need that. <clears throat> Let's move along to the second demo, just basically demonstrating basic functionality of PowerShell on Linux. So, what happened now is because I already had the VS uh, code extension for PowerShell installed. Uh, it actually now saw that it was loaded. Uh, it loaded up a PS1 file and it started the the extension. And now I have the integrated terminal. Basically, bring you uh, a little bit of ISC experience on Linux. So I can just hit F8 now on the selected line, and it will run in that terminal. So if I do that on the PS version table, you can now see that I'm running uh, the core edition of PowerShell 6 uh, with with the alpha 18 build. And we got some, some nifty little automatic variables available to us, like, is this Linux? And, and we get, of course, in this case, the true. And if we ask for, is this uh, a Windows system, then we, uh, we get, of course, the Boolean false. So this will help you guys script out some logic. Uh, maybe this will end up in the PS version table eventually. I, I've, I've seen some uh, issues being tracked there on GitHub, uh, which maybe uh, they will sacrifice these in favor for something else. But now, uh, if you start scripting, you can target these kind uh, of automatic variables to see if your script is running on a certain kind of platform and, and make other assumptions b based on this. Uh, we got uh, uh, a bunch of commands, and if we pipe that to more, then actually this is not the, the more we're used to, this is the Linux more. So we have a, a bit of extra functionality, right? This is native native Linux more, so we, we can also do uh, queries. So let's see, uh, get command. Please note this is case sensitive, but now we can actually search through our uh, more uh, list thing. And we can quit out of that, of course. Uh, basic command lists you would expect that work. Get process, for example, that works. Uh, the basic alias for that, GPS, that works as well. Um, let's look at the environmental drive. So, okay, I cannot use ls. ls is, of course, a, a native Linux binary, and we had a lot of discussion in the past about uh, uh, curl and uh, some others uh, in the GitHub repositories, and they decided to take away all the Linux aliases from the Linux build of PowerShell because we had overlap. And, and uh, Anyways, you can still use the Windows aliases if you prefer, so we can do a dir. And this will enumerate the environmental variables. So, and you can see from, from the output of that environment, this is uh, a Linux system as well. 
Uh, and of course, get shell item would work as well. So a good thing to notice is that the integrated terminal doesn't auto scroll to the bottom, so you need to, uh, to be aware of that. If we look at the PS module pad, we can see, and I hope it's seeable in the back, but otherwise uh, take my word for it, it's, it's not uh, semicolon separated on Linux, it's colon separated on Linux. So the common uh, separator uh, symbol on Linux is, is a colon. So if you want to investigate a little bit better and turn it into a, an array, uh, you, you can separate on the colon instead of the semicolon. So we see a couple of uh, uh, default PS module pads here. Um, for example, we have the, uh, uh, not to mention this one because this is a VS code specific one that gets injected when the uh, VS code extension starts up. But we get the opt Microsoft PowerShell. This is like PS Home, right? This is where uh, normally on Windows you would have System32. Uh, this, this is where the system modules would live. And we have uh, a shared user directory. So uh, slash users, less local, uh, those will contain modules that are shared by all the users making use of this same system. Um, and we got, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm logged in as root. Of course, it's not best practice to log in as root, uh, but it, it was really nifty to do demos as root because it, it saved me a lot of pseudo stuff. Uh, but every user will have its own uh, PS module pad as well. So basically, as, as in Windows, it will be yours, uh, your documents folder. And we got a couple of modules out of the box as soon as we have installed uh, PowerShell. Uh, it's li like uh, the, the package management and pass uh, uh, PS read line, which does not work yet in the VS Code extension, but it does work in the terminal. Uh, we have the archive and, and some other stuff. And if we want to extend, we can already uh, go out into the PowerShell gallery and we can search for the uh, packages that are in there uh, with the tag Linux. <coughs> and uh, there are a couple of uh, modules already available in the PowerShell gallery which target Linux uh, system. Partai. No, no, the, the tag, of course, uh, is optional for a module other to put in the manifest. Uh, if they forget, then, then... They don't have the tag? Hmm. Oh, okay, so... Right, so... You still need to investigate a little bit more, so th this would be a great first start. Thank you, Bartek. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well... There's other ways to investigate the module's compatibility, of course. This will be the, the first way of discovery. So, anyways, um, we have, uh, for example, uh, some Azure RM modules already available that run on Linux, and I'm, I'm going to uh, install those. So, what I'm going to call, as, as you are used to with Windows PowerShell probably, uh, is install module, and I'm targeting uh, that module name, and I'm installing it in my current user scope. It will take that down, it's a little bit big. It's uh, not that big as you are used to with, uh, with the Azure RM modules uh, on Windows uh, because those have become really bloated, right? Uh, so this is actually pretty clean. So we, we got a couple of, of commands available uh, through that modules, um, but not every command in the book. So you, you cannot do an imperative creation of a virtual machine, for example, or a, a virtual network adapter in Azure. You, you have to basically uh, create an ARM template and then you can make use of this uh, module to, uh, to send those out. So if I import that module, and remember to scroll down, uh, I'm going to log in just for demo purposes, uh, the difference between a Windows system and a Linux system. Uh, with Windows, everything is pretty integrated and uh, Edge or Internet Explorer will start up automatically with an iframe allowing you to log in. This doesn't work on Linux. Uh, instead, we get referred to uh, a page we need to visit and we need to enter a specific code. And that, that code is you, something you see here. So let's copy that first and let's click that link. And hopefully Firefox will open and it will. <clears throat> so it will ask me for that code, I will enter that code and just hit continue. Now I have to log in of course and let's see if I can type my password correctly, I did, I can close the browser and if everything went okay, 
this would refresh in a little bit, and now I am logged into Azure. So I'm able now to uh, talk uh, to the Azure ARM API. Let's have a, a really quick look there. Uh, so I can enumerate all the resource groups uh, in my subscription. Uh, for example, I can also enumerate my automation account in my subscription. I only have one. I cannot actually get all the details about it because those commandlets have not made it over yet. But there's this first start, right? So we, we are uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, also, the Azure uh, Active Directory, I can enumerate the, the users are in there. Uh, that's already built in. And most notably, of course, if you're uh, used to working with ARM templates, you can make use of this uh, commandlet to, to send that out to the API. We also can work with Office 365 since the latest build. Uh, I'm not going to demo that because it takes a long time to load up uh, everything, but uh, the code examples will be up on GitHub for you to, uh, to check out. So, I'm a Windows guy. I'm not a real hardcore Linux guy. I work with Linux in, uh, uh, well, mostly in cloud environments where the customer says, oh, you need to do Linux as well. So, oh, okay. Uh, not too familiar, but well, probably will work. So luckily now I have PowerShell, right? And PowerShell will help me in my way, in my, in my pathfinding uh, through, uh, through Linux land. So I, I heard about this Etsy password file, uh, which should contain all the user data. So we, we can have a look there. And we can see we have uh, uh, on the first column here uh, a bunch of usernames. And uh, it, we have that colon separator and then some, some other fields, which I don't really know about, but I, I read uh, man pages or consulted with, with uh, other people. And uh, they said, well, maybe uh, uh, you should use the import, uh, the import CSV and use the delimiter for Linux and put some header files on that. Let, let's see how that looks like. And don't debug, but run, please. So if I look now at the results, uh, I have some objects which are better interpretable for me. And I got a couple of names. Uh, the password are, not, of course, not in this uh, plain text file. They, they are in a, a shadow file. Uh, so UIDs and, and shell information. So if I group that information by shell, you can see, well, actually, nobody has PowerShell as their default shell. So let's change that for this user Ben, which also plays on the system. And let's start a terminal as Ben. So this terminal is started as Ben, and you can see automatically it will start PowerShell instead of Bash. So it's, it's pretty easy uh, getting uh, people to automatically start using PowerShell without them maybe knowing they will. But, uh, well, this is a way we can enforce them too, okay? There's also some other useful files. Uh, basically, of course, everything in Linux land is a text text uh, file, uh, OS releases is one of them. And, and there's a lot of uh, useful information we can make, uh, uh, well, we can make use of in our scripts or functions. Uh, and I've actually written a little uh, wrapper function around this, this, uh, this, this text document. Uh, and by doing this, uh, I c I'm able to show you that normal uh, PowerShell operations like functions and configuration and stuff like that is available to us. So we have here a function called getOSinfo. It has command loop binding, uh, parameters. It has a process block. And basically what it does, it, it just parses out that uh, OS releases and replaces some of the characters we don't really need. And then we throw that data through the convert from string data command loop, which already made it over to, uh, to PowerShell and Linux. So if I load that into uh, memory, hopefully I can do that. Yep. If I call get OS info right now, I get a nice predefined string. Uh, and uh, I also had the optional switch full. And now I have like a hash table output, uh, which I can make use of in my, in my scripts. I, I would like to know some more details about the disk subsystem of this uh, Linux machine. And of course, get disk is not there because get disk leverages uh, a CDI XML uh, functionality on Windows, which did it make it over to Linux and probably will never. Um, get volume, of course, also doesn't work. So what does what do Linux users use? They use this this native co uh, command called df. So with with df, I can uh, uh, get a listing of those volumes, and there's a, a whole bunch of switches to df. So for example, I can uh, add on the minus minus total uh, parameter. And with the minus minus total, I also get an additional uh, field 
uh, with a, a, a total amount of the volume sizes uh, calculated together. And they, they all have these nice switches to make stuff more human readable. So put an H on there and you can see the G representing the gigabytes and the M representing the megabytes. So this is kind of how a Linux uh, uh, operators uh, investigate their file system or their volumes. Now I've, I've run into a little bug with the latest PowerShell version where uh, if I had too many pipelines with native commands, it would uh, uh, lock my session. Uh, so I'm going to send this to bash minus C uh, uh, to see which, which is the volume with uh, uh, the most space available currently. So there we have this, uh, uh, this volume with 36 gigabytes available, okay? Well, since I, I was able to Google foo my way through this, I, I was able to, to look this up. But uh, in the future, I'm more of a PowerShell guy and I would like to simplify my life a little bit. So I wrote a little wrapper around DF and I just uh, uh, put, put out some PS custom objects uh, based upon the, the output fields of, uh, of DF. So using, the, using a split. Now I can just run get Linux volume and I get nice prettified objects which I know how to sort and uh, select and do stuff with. So I now know that this dev uh, temp file system uh, has the, uh, the most free space. <clears throat> so now I've written some nice helper tools and I would like to reuse them over and over again so I'm going to persist them in a, in a module. So I'm going to create a, a module directory uh, just in my, uh, in my user uh, profile. And I'm going to create a PSM1 file there. So the module will be called my tools. And uh, I'm just using this, this uh, little nifty uh, ex the, the, the text extension uh, of those functions to just put out the, the text of the functions to this uh, PSM1 file. And also generate a manifest file. So if everything went correctly and I start a new terminal, I can just uh, do get module name my tools. No, list available of course. And it taps out and you can see that module is available. Um, if I do get command, we can see that those functions are now available to us in every session. So uh, it's really easy uh, creating reusable tools for, for Linux, uh, especially if you're not too familiar with Linux command line. Uh, this would be a really great way to get started. So I, I'm now just able to uh, call into my function. Also, uh, if you work with REST APIs and uh, uh, you are working with those REST APIs from, from Linux, then uh, you need to do our curl or wget or something else and um, basically talk to Python to actually parse that out into prettified JSON format. So I'm going to talk to uh, Swapi here. Uh, Swapi is an API uh, where all of Star Wars is, uh, is living. So you can uh, interrogate that API to get all kind of information about Star Wars. Um, and you can see that they have a couple of uh, um, routing uh, places, so films, peoples, planets. So if I'm going to look at, at species, we will see we got, uh, for example, the, the dark, right? Uh, which is uh, uh, that, that, well, creepy character from episode one. Um, but now I just want to have a little piece of information from that character and I need to regex the hell out of this to get that information in there. So and this is where PowerShell becomes really friendly for Linux users uh, to use because on, uh, working with uh, REST or JSON data in, in PowerShell is really easy. We can just use the invoke REST uh, method and scroll down and we get that same kind of information was being uh, predefined already for us without uh, I was needing to do anything uh, about that. And um, <clears throat> when I'm, I go and look at the people, I can see, okay, so there's a result property. Uh, I can expand that and just select name, right? So there's no need to run uh, complex regexes to this, for this. We can just see all the, the character names now. And we, we can uh, go a little bit deeper and ask for Vader and see with some really, well, 
simple uh, querying uh, if you're used to PowerShell, of course, um, we, we can see which kind of spaceships this Vader guy was, uh, was flying in. So we can see here this Starfighter, right? So this beats regex in, in my book. Um, I would like to point out, I don't have any demos for this, but uh, there's also been already some really awesome uh, community contributions, uh, mainly to the invoke web request and invoke rest method uh, commandlets, where you can now just skip certificate check. Who doesn't run into the uh, uh, occasion where they have an internal API they needed to target and it has a self-signed certificate and you needed to do all that magic to, to get out of the certificate check-in? That's, uh, so, so we're done with that now. This PowerShell 6 uh, eases us uh, with that. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Good, then let's dig into the meat of uh, remoting. So remoting is actually brought to you by OMI uh, right now. So OMI needs to be installed. OMI will bring in uh, WSMAN connectivity. Um, I'm not going to download that OMI because that will take a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to install it from local package. And uh, as, as soon as you have installed the OMI package, a self-signed certificate uh, is created for you, WS man listeners are created for you, and uh, life is good, right? So if you look at the, the service, we can see OMI is running, so it should be available to us. Uh, in the PowerShell world, of course, we make use of port 5985, 5986 to connect uh, to, uh, to the endpoints. And if I do a netstat, I don't see any open ports uh, there. So if you install this package freshly, and I've, I believe they changed this because it used to be automatically uh, configured correctly, but you, you can go into its configuration file, so that, that lives in, uh, in Etsy, and uh, basically zero means uh, it's not being used right now. So we're going to change that with 5985 and the other one, HTTPS port 5986, save that. Override. I'm going to rest restart that OMI daemon. And if everything went correctly, correctly, we now have two listeners. So indeed, we now have 5985 and 5986 available for connectivity. And of course, we have that, that firewall that's also living on Linux. We need to add in those uh, ports in the firewall as well. And now actually external machines are allowed to connect in. So, if everything worked out correctly, I should be able to use uh, some sim commandlets in Windows. I hope that's readable. So, this is a server 2016 core system uh, with a Visual Studio Code installed on it. So if, if you have core systems and you say, oh, I don't want to use core system because I don't have IC, use Visual Studio Code, use core, uh, it's, it's better. Um, this is just normal sim session I'm going to create uh, targeting that remote system. Uh, the CentOS system is listening on 5986 with cell sign certificate, so we're going to opt out into all the revocation checks. And I'm going to use basic authentication because that's configured out of the box. And let's see if we can uh, connect in. And as you can see, a connection was being made. We have now a WSMAN connection uh, to that Linux machine. And we can interrogate one of the default classes uh, uh, that come in OMI, the OMI identify. And you can see we are now uh, talking to a Linux system over WSMAN. Now, what about the other way around? I want to talk sim with uh, Linux to Windows. So if we look, if there are any sim commandlets available for us, they are not. They are not even in the backlog. They are like really far in the future, maybe uh, they will be backported to Linux as well. Uh, but for now we have with the OMI package, uh, the OMI CLI uh, executable. So we can make use of that to talk to our Windows system. And if I run that now, you can see, oh, we, we have authentication failure. And uh, we need to uh, do some fixing on the Windows side of things to allow uh, this communication to take place. And this is not really nice. We need to uh, say that unencrypted traffic is allowed and we need to enable uh, basic authentication on the server side of things. 
if you were using negotiate authentication, which is new in the current version, but I did not get it to work, so I'm not able to demo, then you could actually do the negotiate authentication and the, the communication channel will be encrypted by uh, NCLM. <coughs> or because you're using NCLM, the, the data will be encrypted. But for now, let's just do as if this was uh, uh, ver version alpha 17 <laughs> and just uh, allow that communication to take place. Just so you can see, uh, we, we would be able to talk uh, SIM. And as you can see, I just got returned the results of the uh, Win32 operating system class. Now, of course, we want to PowerShell remote into this, this Linux box, and we need that PSRP additional library installed on the Linux machine. So again, we need to bring that down. It's a separate package. Uh, the uh, PowerShell remote and client actually ship with uh, the Linux package, but the, the server side is an additional install. And I already had that locally, so I'm going to install that now. And now it's installed, I can actually uh, go ahead and make a connection to that uh, Linux machine. So same thing as with the SIM session, I'm going to skip all the CA check-in uh, because we're still making use of that cell sign certificate and trying to create that PS session. And sure, we, we now have a WS man PSRP session to that Linux machine, uh, which we can do all kind of uh, awesome stuff with. For example, uh, we can call native commands on that Linux machine, PS in this case. So. We just called uh, into the Linux machine the PS uh, executable. Uh, we can also enter it. And as you can see, uh, this, this we, we got thrown an error, but we're still in the session. I reported this on GitHub. Uh, it got filed uh, to be fixed after beta one. So this won't be fixed in beta one. Uh, but anyways, uh, we, we have made a remoting connection to this system and we can see that we are now connected to an alpha 18. Uh, machine. If I exit, there's another bug and it will break my current PowerShell, so uh, I need to reload that. Uh, there's no disconnect support yet, no. Uh, it's in the backlog as well, I believe. So I'm restarting my session and, uh, well, this is uh, it's, it's alpha code, this is to be expected, right? It used to work better, by the way, so we had some regression there. Uh, what can we do uh, with those uh, uh, sessions? I, I already created that module on that Linux machine. So what I can do is I actually can import my module implicitly over remoting and have that uh, functions available locally as if they were running on my system, but they are actually proxied to that Linux machine. So if I run get OS info minus full, I actually get the information of that Linux machine. And the same applies to that Linux volume uh, function that's in there as well. So I can manage that Linux machine on my local uh, running PowerShell session uh, yeah, with, without actually touching it. What else? Can we do the copy item to session and from session thing? I was really curious about this. So uh, I have this uh, uh, zero 01 star ps1 file locally here. Let's try to copy that over to the slash tmp directory of that uh, Linux machine. Yeah, but uh, okay, so the question is, would, would, it be, would, would it be possible to just SSH into a Linux machine and start PowerShell from there? Uh, yes, it would, but you wouldn't be leveraging the PowerShell remoting protocol. So you will basically start up a new terminal instance on the remote machine and you, you don't get the object and deserialization and serialization uh, that you're after. So uh, the, the full uh, remoting experience uh, would not be achieved in that scenario. So uh, I just copied over that PS1 file to the remote machine over the PowerShell session. So that works. Uh, I can uh, show you the results by using info command against that uh, uh, machine. You can see from this remote computer uh, that that PS1 file made it over. And uh, the other way around, uh, so let's create a new file with a psconv file. Uh, it contains the value rocks. That can be done, uh, but can I bring it back, right? So in this case, the from session. And this will throw a nasty error, but, but 
actually, if we look in the uh, in the folder, we can see that the file actually made it over. So I, I'm not sure why the error is thrown because it did a really good job. So uh, let's see. Well, there we are. Okay. So let's head back to the SenderOS machine. So that was inbound PSRP. I mean, of course, you're curious the other way around. Does that work as well? Uh, in this case, we're going to use the no encryption because we, we didn't set up uh, NTLM-based authentication yet. Uh, and we're not going to do it in this session, unfortunately. <clears throat> By the way, uh, I've seen already some pull requests where Kerberos uh, support is being merged in. So uh, it will be a lot easier when you domain join your uh, Linux machines and just do it with Kerberos uh, in the near future. And if everything went correctly, we uh, yeah we can create that PowerShell session to Windows as well. So let's see that result. We got a, a WinRM session, and uh, of course, implicit remoting works uh, vice versa. So I can import the server manager module from that remote system and just see uh, which Windows features are actually installed on, on that Windows machine. So not too many because it's a core system, uh, but uh, it's pretty functional, right? Uh, but what kind of uh, PowerShell version are we connecting to? So we, we can see we are connected to uh, the build version 10.001, uh, but we're actually connected to a 5.1 PowerShell version. So what if I wanted to target a PowerShell 6 instance running on Windows? We need to do some additional steps. That's the wrong machine. So first of all, I don't have PowerShell 6 installed at all on this machine. So uh, there's the MSI I've brought down from GitHub. I'm just going to install that. And it's a really quick install because basically it's just an extraction to the C program files PowerShell uh, folder. And now we have that installed. And now I want to actually instruct the VS Code uh, PowerShell extension to start using uh, PowerShell 6, because in a future demo, we're going to leverage some uh, SSH-based remoting, which is not available in 5.1, of course. So what I'm going to tell uh, the VS extension, or the uh, Visual Studio Code extension, that it, it uh, now needs to restart using uh, PowerShell 6. So to do that, I'm going into my user settings and add that little line. Based, and the, the extension will pick up, hey, you, you changed your uh, preferred shell. Uh, do you want me to restart? So I'm going to say yes. And we can see PowerShell is starting, and we now have version 6 running on Server 2016 core. Uh, and we have that available. <coughs> Again, showing the PS version table, uh, the same alpha version uh, running on Windows. If I enumerate the uh, configuration endpoints on this system, you can see we got a couple of uh, 5.1 uh, endpoints. And to uh, get uh, a 6.1 endpoint or a 6.0 endpoint in there, we need to run a, a script that's being shipped with the MSI. Uh, after you install that, it's in the PS Home. Install PowerShell Remoting. Uh, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, hopefully, in the future, they will make something like enable PS Remoting work uh, with. Uh, with targeted, targeting to uh, specific versions. Uh, but right now, I just uh, ran that little script, and we should have an additional endpoint available to us. And it's, it's being listed as a 5.0. Don't, don't be fooled with that. It's, uh, the, the clue is in the name. It says PowerShell 6, right? So. <clears throat> so we can make a remoting session with a configuration name to that PowerShell 6 endpoint. and see if we, we are now connected to that uh, 6 endpoint. And sure we are. So uh, 5.1, 6 uh, connection back and forth. Uh, it all works pretty well, if you ask me, for an alpha. Any questions on uh, WS Man? Because we're moving into SSH. 
What are the, the functionalities of? Uh, so bas bas basically everything you're used to. So uh, the PowerShell remoting just works uh, as expected. You, you can enter it, exit it, besides the box, of course, you, you've seen. So on the Linux side, you, can, you cannot put in constraint uh, configuration. You cannot register, I believe, on the Linux side uh, additional uh, configuration endpoints. Um, JI is, is also not available, for example, so uh, that would be uh, a bit hard still. But the other way around, uh, yeah, that, that from Linux to Windows, that would be possible. Yes? Second hop on WinRM, uh, oh, sorry, what about second hop? Second hop on and WinRM works. Second hop with SSH does not. So if you enter a PS session and you want to hop to the next, uh, then that's fine. And you're using basic authentication, so you, you, you're, you're not passing along session tickets with Kerberos. So uh, yeah, if, if you would be using Kerberos, you will get into the same problem space and you need to set up delegation and stuff like that. Using scope variable, uh, you mean to bring down functions into, yeah, basically everything in the language works. So y using uh, scope definition should work as well, definitely, yeah. Okay, I believe we're a little short on time, so let's make it a bit quick. Uh, I am on Linux system, OpenSSH is already installed. I just need to configure it so it knows about PowerShell. And to do that, uh, and of course, this is all pretty well documented on GitHub, so you can just read over there. We need to add PowerShell as another subsystem. And I need to copy over this line to save myself from typing mistakes. Save that. So now you can see I have an additional subsystem, PowerShell. And I need to restart the SSH daemon, so restart the SSH service. And next, I need to configure the Windows end. And it's actually still a lot of work. So <clears throat> what uh, Microsoft did is they, they forked OpenSSH into a Win32 port and uh, they put that project on GitHub. And basically you can download a zip file for a, a release they did there and install it yourself. Um, currently the version uh, that's available is actually one newer, but my demo broke. So I'm demonstrating the, the previous version. And I, I already downloaded the, the zip archive from the GitHub repository. So I'm just going to extract that into program files. And I'm going to rename uh, OpenSSH minus Win64 to OpenSSH. So that's just the folder name. And I'm going to add OpenSSH to the, uh, to the pod environment variable. And I, I'm, uh, because I'm in PowerShell 6, I don't get full, uh, full CLR support and I don't have the full .NET framework available, so I need to uh, work around uh, adding this, this path to uh, that environment variable. So I'm using sim for, to do that. And by the way, sim, sim is available on PowerShell 6 on Windows. So Then uh, you need to go into that OpenSSH directory and there's uh, a bunch of PowerShell scripts there uh, that help you set up uh, OpenSSH. Basically, uh, it's, I believe, in, ooh, install SSHD. So speaks for itself. Uh, but first, I'm going to also register PowerShell as a subsystem on, uh, on Windows. There we have it. Copy in that line. So we've registered uh, PowerShell as a subsystem, and I'm going to install the daemon by calling that, uh, or daemon or Windows service in this case, uh, by calling in that predefined PowerShell script. It's just a call to it. It does a bunch of magic and sets some uh, low-level pri privileges as well. Uh, we need to generate a server-side key. So SSH makes, uh, makes use of uh, server key and client keys. <coughs> and we need to open the firewall, of course. So port 22 inbound should be opened. And I'm uh, starting PowerShell 5.1 to do this because the uh, new net firewall rule lives in System32 uh, Windows PowerShell v1 modules somewhere in that directory, and it's not available in my PS module pad in uh, PowerShell 6. Uh, start the SSH service, and this is just something I did for myself, so I'm sure that the OpenSSH pod is in my uh, environment. 
and if everything works correctly, I can now use new PS session with hostname uh, parameter. So not computer name, but hostname. And this actually uh, tells a new PS session that SSH will be used. They're still looking into how to do it formally in the future, uh, maybe with uh, minus protocol or something in that, in that sense. But for now, if you specify minus hostname, and, and please note, you can only do a singular uh, uh, string here. So, so not two computers, just one. Um, and uh, then you get the username uh, parameter as well. So if I run new piece session using those, I get prompted if I, uh, if I uh, will entrust that server-side certificate of OpenSSH. And if I say no, the demo is over, so I say yes. Then I need to enter my user password, and I have PowerShell session over uh, OpenSSH, so shell session. Now, every time you get that, uh, that prompt, right? So uh, uh, this is not really functioning uh, uh, big time fan out automation, because if you need to, for every computer connection, you need to enter the password, then you would be uh, yeah, doing some uh, lot of manual labor. So there's also this functionality uh, key-based authentication. So you, you can pre-generate a key pair and authenticate using public key. We will set that up now. And let's do that just real quick. So uh, basically OpenSSH expects the same user to be on both systems and it does kind of dynamic lookup of uh, the key pair. So I'm going to create a user, uh, same as on the Linux machine. And the user is called uh, Ben. And here we see uh, Visual Studio Code bug. Let's stop that. again. So my cursor just jumped somewhere else. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, let's create that local user, add it to the administrator group, and uh, I need to run uh, some commands as that user right now. So I'm going to fire up CMD. Uh, let's try it again. Basically, what I'm going to call is some of the OpenSSH uh, uh, executables to generate a user key. And that's sshkeygen.exe. And this, this requires some user interaction, uh, which is not really necessarily, you, you, you can automate this, but the automation switches, they were not parsed out well by uh, PowerShell 6, so somehow I did not get it to work. Anyways, this is a, a quick workaround. And since it's all alpha, it's, it's still uh, pretty good, right? Uh, I'm going to copy over the public key I just generated over SSH uh, using scp.exe. Uh, uh, and I'm going to put, and it's probably not readable, but I'm going to put it in the home directory of the uh, Ben user on that other machine. And I save it in the authorized keys uh, file. So now the key has made it over. I need to install an additional DLL on this Windows machine. They fixed this in the new version, but it didn't work for me. So I'm still going to install that DLL. Uh, if I move back to my OpenSSH location, or else the script won't be there. And unfortunately, I need to reboot the, uh, the computer real quick. Uh, to make that DLL active. Uh, luckily, it's core, so it's, it's pretty fast. Uh, so in the new version, you don't require the DLL anymore, but I uh, just didn't get the key-based authentication to work, so uh, I might as well just reboot system real quick and, and show you an actual working implementation. So we left off installing that uh, DLL, and we restarted. Let's not run that again. Um, now I can call new PS session, 
and I have the key file path parameter. Uh, so now I'm user administrator, I'm not user Ben, and I'm going to specify the location of my private key. And if everything works correctly, uh, of the, the first time of the server key uh, prompt, you, you cannot avoid. Um, you can pre-populate uh, probably, but anyways, ev every new time I'm going to connect with this machine, I can use this, this uh, key uh, file now and will never be prompted uh, to enter my password again. So I'm just presenting my public key. If I would log on as that user, uh, Ben, so what I'm doing now is I'm actually entering PS session over WinRM locally, and as the user, and I am now user Ben, and I can now just use new PS session without specifying uh, the, the key file path because both users exist on the same, or both, the user exists on both systems, and the resolving of where the uh, public key would be would be automatically handled by SSH. So I can just now do new PS session and it should be created. There we have it. So automatic lookup of that uh, key. How much time do I have? Eight minutes. Wow. Okay. Because this one has depleted already. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I was really nervous for that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so we have OMI installed, we have PowerShell remoting, we have uh, sim sessions going on, and of course uh, there's one piece missing, it's desired state configuration. Uh, I have a package for desired state configuration already downloaded. You need OMI installed to make use of desired state configuration uh, because local configuration manager lives in uh, OMI, in this case namespace. Um, so that's a prerequisite. We can really see everything is, is componentized, right? If you're used to installing WMF uh, 5 or 5.1, it, it took care of everything for you uh, with one installer. Uh, now you can actually see uh, of, of how many components uh, things are built up. So I installed DSC uh, on Linux. Uh, you can actually see also uh, a lot of the resources uh, are getting installed with it. And uh, the cool thing now is that uh, because I have the Visual Studio Code extension uh, on Linux running, I can now refresh this configuration and uh, the red squiggly you saw disappearing is because DC is now there and it knows, oh, and now I can see uh, that, uh, what, what to do with the configuration. So we now have a configuration available. Uh, maybe I can minimize that. can see him too. Ah, good. So I have this configuration and it will install uh, a bunch of packages, uh, for example, uh, EPEL release and we need, uh, that's, that's a remote uh, repository containing additional packages, uh, which contains Nginx uh, package. Nginx is web service, going to install web service. So I declare the end state of this, this machine to be, and I'm going to create this a really cool website uh, using the uh, NX file resource. And finally, we'll start the Nginx service. So this is just the declarative configuration uh, of uh, uh, this Linux machine using DC configuration uh, script. But the cool thing now is we, we were never able to compile this on Linux because we didn't have PowerShell on Linux. But now, so because we have PowerShell on Linux, we are perfectly able to do this. So I just loaded this into memory, and if everything went correct, uh, I now have uh, this configuration available for me. But um, let's skip over this a little bit. Um, if I want to apply that configuration, I actually don't have any commandlet available locally to do that. So I, I don't have start a DC configuration, for example. It's not, it's not in there. So how would I actually uh, uh, generate the MOF file locally and, and start sending it to the local configuration manager so it could converge. Well, first I just had loaded that configuration in memory, as you can see, I have Nginx configuration available. So if I call it, probably uh, MoFile will be created, and it does, so I have successfully compiled MoFile. And I I'm going to make use of uh, start DC configuration.py, which is of course not uh, a PowerShell command, but it's a Python command. So what we will do here is mix and match 
Python and PowerShell because I'm going to specify the location dynamically by substituting uh, with PowerShell command get location. So I'm going to call in with a call operator that uh, the Python script, it will start Python and it will start uh, sending in that MOV file. And we have return value of zero, so that means a probably success. Uh, there's also testdc configuration.py, so we can test if the desired state has been implemented. We can see is desired state equals true, so that's, that's gone good. And we can also get the current state using getdc configuration.py. And we can see all the, the meta information uh, we, uh, we can use to inspect the system. And finally, let's look at the result of that, that nifty uh, little uh, website I created using DSC. And I just want to say that that really felt good, man. So, uh, yay. <laughs> and with that, I want to head back to the slides. Uh, there's only one slide, so it's a summary. Uh, PowerShell 6 to boldly go where no man has gone before. So me as a non-Linux guy, I'm now able to actually start using Linux in a, in a more uh, of, a, of a way I'm uh, familiar with. So I'm not stepping out of my comfort zone like 200%, but just 80%. And uh, I can make use of PowerShell to investigate uh, what I need to do to, uh, to manage Linux. Um, I am up for questions, if there are any. Can I connect from the Linux box to the pool server? Uh, you, you mean the LCM? Yeah, yeah, def there's a download manager just as well as in Windows. So uh, uh, you can do that, yeah. Anyone else? Then I'm done. Thank you.